Hey everybody, welcome to Feel of Dreams on NCBNTT. I'm Steve David and I'm your host. Today I want to talk about um, player development and joining me on the set to dis have that discussion would be Dexter Cyrus. Welcome to the set, Dexter. Pleasure to be here, Steve. I know you're anxious about this um, topic because you ended the show talking about kind of player development. And that gave me, hint me that we need to take this a little further um, because last week we talked about positional stereotype and this led to what we're going to talk about today. So let me set the stage for that and then we would have a discussion going forward on from position from the goalkeeper to defense to midfield to forward, or we can do a general barbershop and just talk about all the things that we need to to do in football. The whole idea about this show is train to to train or to not train, but and um, to educate the viewers, to educate coaches, to educate players on things that that they need to know or uh, for, the, for the viewers because sometimes the viewers would people in the stand and the referee makes a call and they say well, and you know just because they don't know the rules and they don't know, there's a lot of things that they need to know and, and then when people like us explain it to them now they understand they're better, they're better supporters and so on and so on so um, in the positional stereotype, we talk about uh, what we look at initially. We look at these uh, people and we put them in positions. But now, t today I want to talk about developing the player for that position. And um, sometimes they're not cut out to be that. Like, like in this case, uh, Kenwin, like we talk about, he was a defender and they push him up front. Now they have to turn him into a striker, and so on and so on. So let's talk about goalkeepers. Um, and you would have expert ideas on that, your coach. Um, let's talk about goalkeepers. And we just talk about things we do to develop them and to get them ready for the position they're in. OK, so um, have you been through any of that? and? Give us some in, in, insight or light on how you did it. Well, I, I can't say that I am. I can't say that I am the. I am a. Um, what should I say? I am a expert. Expert when it comes to developing goalkeepers. Right. Right. Um, the goalkeeper coach, right, they, um, usually takes the goalkeepers and. Um, takes them through their um, drills and that kind of thing, right? Um, as, that's, that's, that's like later on when they make teams and things. I'm taking a kid from scratch to develop them, mm -hmm. right? Um, into a goalkeeper, you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe um, you, would, you, would, you would look for certain things, right, first. Um, so you would be able to choose the kid that is most suited to develop, right? Um, kids with good hand-eye coordination, kids with good um, feet, right? Um, the kid who has maybe a, 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 a large physical presence, right, for the goalposts. Um, the, the, the kid who is flexible and athletic and all these things, you know? Um, some kids end up goalkeepers because um, they're not able to make the outfield team and they end up in the goal and they end up giving their all into the, in the position and they, they end up developing into quality goalkeepers, right? Um, but, but let me um, think. Like we don't see, like we are a multi-sport country. We play everything, right. the, the people. 
and we would think we would see more basketball type players yeah, because yeah. basketball you got to move your feet to defend right a goalkeeper the ones who move his feet is always better than the one who just throw himself across the goal yes, all the time yes, yes. And, and that kind of stuff right yes. so so I would think um, once we establish those are the players we want then we take them through certain drills and develop them to to be cat like or to be now we have to learn to play with the feet and that, those are the different things I'm talking mm -hmm. about um, no, no matter what position you're talking about mm -hmm. um, you need to if you're taking a kid from scratch, when as far as development goes, you need to open the kid's physical gate and develop the coordination of the child. Right. In football, um, if I can't coordinate the kid, mm -hmm. I can't make him into a footballer. There's no point. Mm -hmm. If children who ha doesn't have good coordination, they don't make good footballers. Right. It's a it's a total body movement and being a goalkeeper, now that's a specialist position. So it, it calls for ability with the feet, it calls for ability with the hands, it calls for that sharp eye. You have to collapse, you have to get up, maybe make a second save, you have to throw, you have to catch, right? You more than likely in corners would be the, would be the one person who would have an advantage in a crowd because of the the ability to um, to use your hand when a, when a corner is coming and these kind of things. So a goalkeeper is being a specialist in in when it when it comes to developing the specialist. There are things that we have to use initially for his foundation, but there are other things that um, would pertain to his training alone. Be, as you said that, it just make me aware a normal footballer is hand, feet coordinate, I mean not hand, but eye, foot coordination, right? Goalkeeper has to have that and they also have to have hand-eye coordination. Hand-eye -eye, hand coordination. So they, they, they have even more. Yeah, they have even more. To, to get to, yeah. to learn. Yeah, and, our, and the outfield players um, um, eye and eye, eye foot coordination, eye feet coordination, being different from the goalkeeper's hand eye coordination. The goalkeeper's hand eye and feet coordination comes into play a lot of times while they are going to the ground. Right. Outfield players, that will never happen to you. That, that right. will never happen to you. While they are going down to the ground, they have to collapse and coordinate their body to make sure. And hold on to the ball if a shot is taken and all these sorts of things. So it's 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 a specialist position um, and you obviously need a specialist coach to deal with goalkeepers. And I, I totally agree with you and um, also I remember and I have to say this because it's so important to prevent goals especially early in the game. I remember us playing Mexico in Haiti and Kevin Barkley. He came onto the field to replace, uh, not he came onto the field, onto the team. Because when Kevin Verity came here, the coach from England, he didn't know the players. So he picked the best goalkeeper he see practicing, which was Kevin Barkley and not Gerald Figaro, which was really the number one goalkeeper. If a local had coached that team, Figaro would have been in goal because he was this stalwart. He was the guy who, who locked down that position. But Kelvin Barkley got into that goal, and we played Mexico. And in the first 10 minutes of the game, he made some kind of save. And that was, that like set the tone for us. Yeah. And after that, it was all history. Yeah. So, so it's so important to have that strength or support in the goal as far as the goalkeeper is concerned. 
Yeah, and, and good goalkeepers tend to settle teams. Yes. Um, goalkeepers that might be a little fidgety and uh, make little mistakes, they tend to make their team, they tend to make their defense nervous. And once the defense is nervous, it tends to spread to the rest of the team. A good goalkeeper tends to settle teams, um, make them very calm, um, and that, uh, that augurs well for good football, it augurs well for confident football um, going forward. And you know something as well, um, uh, goalkeepers don't like to run. And um, we're talking about develop, development now in the outfield. And goalkeepers, when it's time to run, doing shuttles and uh, different things, they're the, always the ones who lag um, for whatever reason. I mean, then, but I look at goalkeepers' workout, and it is brutal. Yeah. I mean, you know, to dive and get up and fall and get up and, ju and jump and run back and run forward and it's brutal. Yeah. But they go through hell. Yeah. So to speak. More than I, we do, but running they don't like that. Um I can go back to when I am. Um, I can go back to when I just landed in Portugal and my agent took me to the Estadio da Santas, which is the Porto Stadium to see. Um FC Porto, who Latte, Russell Latte was playing for at the time, to see the team train to prepare for um, a Champions League game against Fiorentina. Mm -hmm. And Vitor Bahia, who was the FC Porto goalkeeper at the time, the goalkeeper coach was throwing balls at him. And usually I know that a coach throwing balls to a goalkeeper, he would be right in front of the goal and that kind of thing. Um, this coach threw the ball to Vita Bahia, the full length of the field. And he dived to his left, the full length of the field going that way. And then he dives back to his right, the full length of the field going back that way. The field or the goal? The full length of the field. Oh, you mean, oh, you, mean you just keep throwing just and keep going? Diving the yeah, okay. full length of the field. I got you. And, and yeah. I was like, I was... I, I, was, I was in shock. I was amazed because I, I was like, goalkeepers is really training that hard. Yeah, they and do. that set the tone for me mentally because now I realize, Cyrus, you, you, you're in a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. You are in a whole different ball game. Yeah, uh, I see, I saw, and just to talk about some of that, I saw Verity used to work out Barclay and Figaro. Oh, mm -hmm. Lord in the mud too, eh? they take the ball and they bring it to the to the edge of the box and they hand it to him and they had start to backpedal and then he, th he throws it and they got to go and tip it over the crossbar, mm -hmm. fall, pick it up, bring it back and hand it to him like, like penance, you know, like, yeah. and I'm like, mm. I, it, it is tough. Yeah. But, but I mean, running is so much easier. Running is you put one foot the next to the other and go. Yeah. Uh, but that is tough. So they, they go through real regimental structure. But when they save you a, a goal, uh, you know, save you something that could be a goal, then you understand why they work so hard. Um, I, think we could, I think we could relate to... Um the player that they call one Roman Riquelme, mm -hmm. he, um, he said that he, um, even in training, he would not go in the goal because he um, was of the impression that goalkeepers is, is mad, mad men. Mad, yeah. And um, every time he goes into the goal, he has a fear that he can't explain. And he never, not even in training, when all the other players would go in goal and let another player take a penalty on them and that kind of thing, he never went in a goal and never faced a penalty. And it's one of the, also one of the reasons why he had a fear of taking penalties. And that's one Roman Riquelme. He wore the number 10 jersey for Argentina. Right. And Barcelona. Right. So, 
you know, um, so I, we, I'm to, we're talking about this now because I need the coaches to know and the goalkeepers themselves to know their job because, like you said, you don't do goalkeeping coaching. You have a specialist to teach them, but their job is real, real, for real hard. And they have lots of work to do to get there. I see people take tennis balls and throw at them, and they got to get up and walk, you know, real. So out there, for the, for the players who want to be a goalkeeper and the coaches who want to train their goalkeepers, you got to take them through the mill. Yeah. Yeah, how to take them through the mill. Um, we, we, we know us being former strikers, we know that the game is won or lost on either end of the field. Right. Yeah. So when you lead in one nil and your goalkeeper makes a spectacular save, is he won the game? Right. You know, if exactly. he didn't make that save, you'll draw. Yeah. Sure. All right. So, um, so we both inexperienced and really um, developing a goalkeeper. We know how hard they work and we know how tough it is and how important it is for the goalkeeper to get. So let's move on to defenders. Let's talk about defense. How you as a coach, with your wing backs and stabbers and coordination, you know the defenders, one person go, and then the ball is played behind where they were, and then somebody has to go out and cover there, and they have to come back in to, and talk about that, about development of defenders and, and that kind of thing. Right, now, um, as far as, as far as, as I said before, as far as developing any player for any position, you would need to first coordinate the player if we're taking them from scratch. Mm -hmm. And when they reach a certain age, there are certain things that would need to be introduced. Right? Um, the foundation of the player is the first, is the first element. You need to deal with a player just like how you deal with a house. You have to give him the proper foundation first. The foundation can come after. So, what remains constant? What remains constant on the football field? Control, pass, and movement. Mm -hmm. So we need to give the player that foundation. While we're giving him that foundation, we would look for certain attributes in the kid, mm -hmm. especially if we see that he loves our battle, if we see that he's a tough kid in the tackle, and that kind of thing. We say, all right, fine. He looks to be suited to be a defender, and we work on that. If we see a kid who likes the battle and has a lot of running power, he might be more suited not just to be a defender, but to be a wing back. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously we balance the team that way. The right footed kid who likes to run and battle. Good in the tackle, we put them on the right side. The left footer, we put them on the left side. And we start to groom them based on positions. The development of the player can only be accomplished if we make sure that these kids train every day in formation and structure. You, we, we can't put that work into a kid and then put them to play 4v4. No. No. Mm -hmm. Every day they have to train in the formation and structure all the time so that they're able to take pictures from that position every time. The boy who we're training to be a left back, he must be able to take pictures from a left back position and make decisions from a left back position from the time he is able to understand formation and structure. And I'm thinking that that could be somewhere around eight or nine years. Mm -hmm you could start to introduce them to that. Right. Right. We have to understand that is how, that is the key element. The key element is being able to put these kids to play in formation and structure every time we play. We mustn't coach kids and then put them to sweat. We mustn't coach kids and, and just put them to play 4v4 all the time. Okay, no. so, so there was, kids going to have weaknesses and strengths, right? right? So what you work on, the, the, you would work on the weakness or the strength of both? Right. So in, in the development stage, we have to identify the flaws and the weaknesses of the kid. Okay. When you identify the flaws and the weaknesses of the kid in the development stage, you work on that. 
You're working on you're working on both. the flaws and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Right? And try to bring okay, he, maybe he's already good at something. We try to bring his weakness up. Because you don't want to have an off balance developed kid. You don't want to have a kid who is really, really good at 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 at, at, at running or that kind of thing and tackling, but you can't sort his feet out when you when you pass him the ball. You don't want that kind of thing. You understand? Sometimes it have kids who are slow starters. Sometimes it have kids who are very good, very good touch, but physically they're not in a good place. You need to develop these things. You need to identify these things about these kids and develop these things so that when they reach a certain age, all these things must be able to marry. They must be able to marry. We must be able to marry these things in order to get the complete developed player. Right, so, um, for example, I was coaching Civic uh, for a little bit, and not recently, 2000 or, or some of that. And by accident, I found out my whole team could hardly kick with the left foot. Right. I shut the practice down. I says, we only play, in, we play in left foot only. Right. And it takes about two or three weeks, and they they came along, and I was wondering why didn't somebody recognize that before? We we tend to as coaches in Trinidad and Tobago um, not understand that there's a difference between development training and training for competition. Right, it's a big difference. So the coach who is training you for a competition, when you come to training. He might give you a, a 15, 20 minute warm up, and then after that, you might have to do maybe 40 to 45 minutes of physical work to bring you up, to get you physically fit and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you put that time together, that's an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes of not touching the ball. The kid has just lost an hour and 10 minutes of contact hours with the ball mm -hmm. because he's training for competition. The kid who is training for development, when he comes, we let them warm up with the ball. Then we do passing drills, we do juggling. Then we let them play maybe a 4v4 or 3v3 game, and then we open it out into a formation and structured game. Mm -hmm. Every single thing is done with the ball. There are certain days you will put in physical work, but you're not dealing with that every day because the kids are not being trained for competition. They are developing. Right. When you train a kid for competition and they lose an hour contact with the ball, three, four years down the road, what happens? You know it's three, four years of, of losing, losing an hour yeah. contact with the ball? Three or four. So we have two kids who, one is training for development and he has a, he's, be, he's able to get that hour contact with the ball right through and then we have a kid who's training for two hours and he's losing one hour contact with the ball and then the next hour the coach might want to work on his tactics and all that kind of thing and then that kid now still doesn't make the team and doesn't get to play on the weekend when the other kid who's doing the development work he gets to play every weekend what happens three years down the road what happens four years down the road Let's the, take a break. The kid uh, who's developing uh, uh, goes up, right? You tell us about that when we come back. Let's take a break. Sure. Uh, viewers will be right back after the short break. Current affairs. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Welcome, one and all. I am Gigi Love. Alongside my psychic, Mr. Ruka. Your partner in crime, Juliet. And we are going to be live on NCBM on a social media platform near you. IG, Facebook, YouTube. We are going to be... Sensational. Tantalizing. Thought-provoking. Dramatic. Educational. Real. Sometimes spiritual. Mm. Suspense. Political analysis. Drama. Take no prisoners, Juliet. Don't forget that part. Coming soon.
back viewers and in case you're now tuning in you're looking at Field of Dreams and NCBNTT I'm Steve David and joining me on the set today is Dexter Cyrus so Dexter uh, we were talking about uh, before about you put talking about a person who has to do in development and the other person doing something else how you marry the two and how you make it work for you as a coach um you don't want you don't want to take the kid away from competition mm -hmm. but you have to find a way to marry development training with whatever else the kid is doing right because okay like let's say for instance um secondary school football right the kids might start maybe at the age of 12, 13, mm -hmm. right? Um, secondary school football is a big thing in Trinidad and Tobago. Kids take their secondary school football very seriously. Um, the whole of Trinidad and Tobago plays football from, let's say, August. Mm -hmm. So you get the zonal, the zonal football, maybe the Super League, then you get the, you get the secondary school football starting at, in September. All of Trinidad plays football, let's say, from August, right? Um, if, we, if we have to look at the development of kids, right, obviously we have to let them play with their schools. They go into a school, they have to play football with that school. But we can't stop the kid from getting his development work with his club. The kid has to develop because he's only, he's 12, he's 13, he's 14. So it's like... It's not the finished product. So we take instructions from a coach, of course. Right. And we go in the schoolyard or in the road or in the yard. And I think, isn't that where we get more, most of our development from? Well, Playing by ourselves? Well, well, okay, let's look at secondary school football where maybe it's a two and a half month showcase. Mm-hmm. That's two and a half months of competition, right? right. Where's, the kid, where's, the, where's the kid? What's the kid going to do for the next 10 months, nine and a half months? What's he going to do? Just sit in his classroom and come to school and miraculously improve for the next season? No, he plays with his boys right. in the, he has the, the streets. Right. He, he, some boys, mm -hmm. they might not belong to a club. They play street football. Mm -hmm. The boys who belong to clubs. We, what we have to understand is the clubs that we would have put kids into these clubs are they competition clubs or development clubs but don't you think though we're getting so sophisticated about things like like for example i would go to look at training sessions and we got the best drills going on and the, the kids are executing the drills perfectly but when you go in the field it's not drills it's and in the in the schoolyard or in the streets we play in ball and we jump over we jump over some canal or or a drum to play because that's in the way mm -hmm. so we, we learn to get out of the way you know I, i'm just saying sometimes it's so much more you gain from playing in the street. From structured coaching. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's why I'm not a fan of coaching. I say it all the time. Coaching because I think we're too structured, especially for those young kids. Right. Let so, them express themselves. Right. So what we need to understand is, one, you don't want to overcoach the kid. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. You need, you need to put kids, if you want them to develop for a position, you need to put them to play in formation and structure and let them express themselves. You're not taking away anything from the child. The child must be able to learn via trial and error, making mistakes, making mistakes, and making sure that the coach is able to make the child understand that it's okay to make mistakes. Because that's how you want them to learn. Because that's how we learned in the street. But Unsupervised, making mistakes. That's the part. I think I think sometimes you let them work it out. You sit down, yeah, and you see them do something wrong, and you yeah. let them work and it let, out. Leave them to play. Mm -hmm. 
and they will work it out. Right. Because if it is, it depends on the contact hours. If it is, like for instance, if you're coaching a group of kids five days a week, they will work it out eventually. Mm -hmm. They will work it out eventually. But what we have to do is we have to make the kid understand that it's okay to make mistakes. Learning is, you, three ways of learning. You can learn via direct instruction. You can learn via visual and you could learn via trial and error. So at the end of the day, trial and error works really, really well in development for boys, for kids, right? boys and girls, you know, really, really well. Trial and error where, where they, 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 they put in the situation to make decisions. Okay, I didn't get it right, no problem. But when I'm in the situation again and again and again and again, eventually they're going to work it out and when they work it out that way that's when it sticks so how important it is for blackboard work in development compared to be under fail actually doing the drills or doing um, playing um I, I i i am not seeing the importance of of doing blackboard work for development for development kids okay I think that is something when you reach the professional level and now you want the coach, the coach wants to be specific about, he, because he wants to play a particular way, he wants to do a particular, he wants to have a particular game plan for a particular team, that's when blackboard work would come in and, and, and you as the young professional would have to adhere to that. But in the development stage, I'm not seeing the importance of that. Right. Yeah. That's just for team, team structure. Yeah, that's for team structure. Plan. I went later on, later on. In the development stage, I, I'm thinking the, 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 sometimes, we just want to, mm -hmm. sometimes we just want to do, we just want to have shortcuts, but there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut. You have to get the proper contact hours, and you have to put the kids in the formation and structure and let them play, let them express themselves. How do, how you get the message to kids based on because if I'm playing a game, something happens that I didn't react to like I should. So I learn from that. I remember that because in a game, same thing happens over and over in front of your eyes. Sometimes it, it happens once for the game, but sometimes it can happen ten times. Yeah. So now you have to learn and and remember some things that you missed. How can you get kids to understand that this is repetitive and you got to make sure you keep sharp and learn? And how you, how you, you, you get that over them without blackboard work? Or what do you do? You talk to them in the field? Yeah, you talk to them in the field. But the thing about it is that you have to put in, in training, mm -hmm. right, based on how you want the kids to play. Okay, let's say you have a young team, maybe uh, maybe 10-year-old boys, maybe 11-year-old boys, mm -hmm. maybe 12-year-old boys. Let's say you have a team between the ages of 10 to 12, 11 to 13, all around there. Um, and you want the boys to, 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 to get certain things uh, cemented in their head. It has to come from on the, training on the training field. We can't wait for the day of the game for that. That has to come on the training field and this is what we want to do. This is how we intend to play. Hear what? We're going to train this way. So, so it becomes automatic on the day of the game. It becomes automatic when you ask them to play against an opponent, a different opponent. This is what we're going to do. And now they are able to play in formation and structure and take pictures and make decisions. And today, tomorrow, the next day, and the contact hours. And that is where the confidence comes from. So that's why then you blow the whistle, you stop the game, you explain it, and then you continue. And then you continue. Right. But you need to allow them to make mistakes. Leave the dribbler, let him dribble. Leave the kid up front who likes to shoot, let him shoot. If it is there are um, fundamental breakdowns when it comes to certain facets of the game, you stop that because um, you don't want to let kids get away with... Um, passing the ball badly, you know? Um, 
applying bad technique when it comes to controlling and, and passing the ball. You want boys to play with their bodies open, always pass the ball and give good supporting angles and that kind of thing. Those are the things, are the things that you can stop the game for. But other than that, leave them to play. So you have a kid who is technically sound but has one weakness. And playing and and every time, let's say he can't use one of the feet, so he and it's, it's hampering his game. How do you do, t try to get him to develop that w within the structure, within the training structure? Right. I mean, so, you, you, you pull him out. What, right, what do you so, do? So so. If you have a kid who have only has the ability to use one foot, mm -hmm. then he has to be able to use the inside and the outside of that foot. That's the first thing, because that's the gifted foot. Mm -hmm. Let's say he's a right footer. Mm -hmm. The right foot is gifted. The kid is a very um, technically good player with that one foot. Then we have to get him to use not just the inside of the foot, but we have to get him to use the outside of the foot. So that would facilitate for the lack of the other foot, right? Um, to bring in the weak leg, to, to get the weak leg stronger, we need to get the muscle, to get the memory from the hip flexor, mm -hmm. right? Um, he, can, he can, the kid can, hang a, a football from the roof in a socks or a net and go, go home and keep hitting mm -hmm. the football, swing away from him and come back and he could keep hitting it. Just all he needs to do is have the football hanging at, at knee height. Mm -hmm. And you just hit the football and it swing away from him and it come back and he keep hitting it. And the muscle, the hip flexor, gets the memory. When the hip flexor gets that memory, obviously the, he, he will start using he will start using the weaker foot. That is kicking. Yeah. Control. Playing, dribbling. Yeah. But because because it's I'm saying from the experience, it's so easy for me to go right to left. Yeah. If I'm coming up as a defender. Yeah. You don't know if I'm going right or left because I can play with both. I can go right or can go left. Yeah, and that is very difficult for defense. Very difficult. So you you know so how you, these are things that you have to get them to be able to do. And and these are things that you can do with drills, uh -huh. and then you can play games <laughs> to Im, to um, implement that. Right. Right. Um, there are a lot of um, okay. Let's say for instance, once you understand progression, you do passing drills and then you go into a passing game right passing games entail a lot of these things being able to use the left foot use the right foot in different situations and those and those kind of things but you have to give the kid the confidence as the coach mm -hmm. making him understand that even if he uses the weaker foot he uses the weaker foot and it doesn't come off there's nothing wrong with that you are developing mm -hmm. this is you are not the finished product you use your left foot and it didn't come off, that's okay. You are developing. Once you start doing it now, two years down the road, it's going to get better and you're going to be able to use it. But the coach has to instill that into the head of the kid. You don't want him to make a pass or try to use the weaker foot and then the pass doesn't come off and then the coach gets on his high horse and comes down on the kid and he will never use the foot again. I was just about to say that. He will never use the foot again. You drive by and you see somebody yelling at a, a kid. For, yeah. Or a player for not, uh, for trying with, uh, but, and it didn't work. Right. But you, you come down. On it. Right. Not realizing that the, the, the coach has to understand, I am wearing a development hat. I am not coaching the kid mm. for competition. Competition coaching is here. What You got to get it right or you can't make the team. Right. Because we're in a competition. A lot of kids who are not competition ready, there are some kids who you might be able to use, who, you know, they're on the fringes, and then there are kids who are competition ready. So do you tell them on the day of practice? Because sometimes we do, and sometimes I say, you guys can do, if I'm coaching, anything you want, dribble, damn, pass, if you don't feel like passing, you don't do this is a day to just play, express yourself. Or do you, you know how you separate those from the normal? It day? depends on the level of your group, right? If your group, you you must know the level that your group is at based on how good they pass the ball. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the the passing of the ball, the ability to retain the ball, 
is going to tell you how good your group is at. Your group, not two or three men in the group. Mm -hmm. Right? The ability for the team to pass the ball well, good passing teams, they dictate the level of play that your team is going to play. Right? Um, so it depends on the group that you have. You might have a better technical group than me. Mm -hmm. And I will have to work on certain things in order to bring them up to that level. You know, because of the fact that your group is more advanced, you would be able to do different things in your training session. Like, for instance, you might be able to give your group two touch. You might be able to tell them two touch in their half and you can go and play free in the next team's half when you set, when you, when you, when you set up your grid because they are already of that level. My group, I might have to tell them, here what, three touches because... They might need a little more time or a little extra touch in order to dominate the ball. So it depends on where your group is at. All dependent on that. And also individual players. And, and, also, the, and also the individuals. Because some players naturally can draw. Naturally. Some players, you, you have to give them a book to learn how to draw. Yeah. And, and so how you develop those? Or those, those are just naturally non dribblers And you say, hey, you get it. You play it. And you, you know, keep it simple. There are certain attributes that comes yeah. with the natural dribbler. You, you, you're able to see in the feet the, uh, the balance and the, the, the coordination, the fast twitch muscles will make them be able to turn on a dime and all these things, right? Those attributes naturally come with, with dribblers. The softness of the knees, the, able, the ability to drop the shoulder on one side and go to the next, and the ability to keep the ball so close to their feet. Um, these things is things that a lot of attributes of dribblers come naturally and then as we recognize then us as coaches we can now add to that get them to marry certain things to other things so that their dribbling ability becomes they become even more successful at dribbling then there are other boys who not because they can't dribble we're, not, we're going to tell them that they're not, good, they're not going to be good role players. They have very good role players in the world, especially wing backs, especially defensive midfielders. You don't want your defensive midfielder dribbling, but you want him to be able to play that role based on how the role is supposed to be played. You don't want him to just be able to take up a ball. Okay, you're a good defensive midfielder, but you can take a ball up and run through the team with it. Not because you could do that means that, that you're going to do that because that role doesn't call for that. Yeah, what do you think makes a person a better dribbler than an, an another? Um, is it the, the amount of time they spend with the ball? With the ball, yeah. Yeah, I think. It is, right? Yeah, I think, yeah. And, and so anytime somebody can dribble the ball as, as well, they need to spend more time with the ball. Yeah, need to put, yeah, yeah. And get comfortable. Yeah, I think. When you when you when you look at the um when you look at the go back and look at the story of Maradona, Maradona had a ball that he deflated that he used to carry to school in his bag. And then he would pump the ball up during recess time and play with it. And then head Deflated. back down to go back into class. And he would do that every day. Now that's it sounds like a lot, but the kid who loves the ball that's nothing to him because he wants to play half that time with the ball. Let's take a break on, on that one and we'll come back in a, in a short break. Viewers will be right back after the short break. Hi, join us for your movie classics on NCBN TT Television Network every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. with repeats on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, NCBN Television, the number one online television network, bringing you the classics.
we could take strain. That's why when we fed in, we just fed that when we jamming. We just jam down when we drinking. Man, it's strong rum, eh? Pop my bottle right now when we fed in. We just fed that when we jamming. We just jam down when we drinking. Man, it's strong rum, eh? Pop my bottle. Push up your hand, yeah. We see my this bad. Push up your hand. Current affairs. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Welcome, all of I am Vicky Love. Alongside my psychic, Mr. Ruka. Your partner in crime, Juliet. And we are going to be live on NCBM on a social media platform near you. IG, Facebook, YouTube. We are going to be... Sensational. Tantalizing. Thought-provoking. Dramatic. Educational. Real. Sometimes spiritual. Mm. Suspense. Political analysis. Drama. Take no prisoners, Juliet. Don't forget that part. Coming Come soon. soon. Hey. 20,000 to rise against me like zombies and juve morning. Hey. Yeah, 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 Jesus will supply yeah. Good Lord, more than enough What you need? Who oh, was just calling and download and donate now? Hey, hold with no cup of them empty Jesus Okay, welcome back, viewers. Um, Dexter. So now we're talking. Uh, let's talk development for midfield strike, uh, strikers. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that that works for us, or we or works as as coaches or as a player. And and you know, let's barbershop discuss this one. So. I'll let you take the lead on how you develop a striker. Um, developing a striker is easy. Mm -hmm. But the, you can't develop a goal scorer. Right. You have to have that knack. You have to have that clear understanding of and that ability to be in the right place at the right time. You know? Um, the striker or the kid that plays in the front, you will have two kids, maybe three kids. Let's, call you, let's, let's say a handful of kids. You have mm -hmm. five strikers. And there's, you're going to, there's, going to, there's going to be one who he's always able to end up in the right place at the right time. And you didn't coach him that because you can't coach him that. 
there are others you're able to tell hey what I want you to do this I want you to do that I want you to do this and they're not able to do it that's why the top clubs around the world pay millions of dollars more for attacking players players who can score players who can get the ball in the net because you can't develop you can't develop the goal scorer you know you can't develop the goal scorer what is important is in the development stage of the the attacking players the players that you want closest to the goal the players that you want closest to the goal is the players with the high technical ability the technical ability must always be high. they must always be technically good technically sound technically gifted these are the players that you want closest to the goal mm -hmm. um obviously you would also want your your playmaker in the middle of the field to be a highly technical player also because you want the ball to pass through him all the time but the players who are closest to the goal they have a target to hit usually that target is the goal a final ball to a player which might be in the form of a true pass a one two or a cross they have a target to hit mm -hmm. right now they take a very special emphasis on wingers now in the game because of the fact that they are developing them to drop the ball on a dime because wingers now are used way more than any other player on the field mm -hmm. they have the most touches they have the most they do the most running most of the time um the good ones especially with the with the, with the mega teams um the top teams in the world and like for instance Sadio Mane Sadio Mane would he his 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 heat map would be from one goal line almost to his goal line almost to his box mm -hmm. defending he's running that whole flank you know um so as far as i i am saying as far as the development of the attacking player goes one in the foundation stage we need to make sure that these kids become technically so they must be able to handle the ball and put the ball where they want all the time because the technical players are the players that you want closest to the goal they have a target to hit all the time they have a target to hit all the time not necessarily the goal is not always the target the the target could be one of your partners the target could be from making a cross and dropping that ball exactly on your on your on your teammates head you know but they always have a target to hit and that calls for it calls for um, a high level of technical ability. Let, let's talk to them about, and everything you say you write, um, about getting into position to score and scoring. And I say that because um, we as strikers, you never know exactly where you're going to end up. But nobody sees you make one and you didn't come and you make two and you didn't come and make three and you make four before you get the ball to your foot. Right. And nobody pays attention to that, right. but, but we do a lot of off the ball running, right. cat and mouse game. Right. So we, let's talk about that. And the second thing let's talk about is when we see that goal and we glance at the keeper and then you put your head down. Right. You know, you don't need to pick it up anymore because you already have peripheral vision. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you, c you know where you're going to put it and you can change it. And if i looking at that, the goalpost there, doesn't mean I'm going to hit there because I already know it's there I'm going. Right. So, if, you know, it's all of that. So, let's talk about that so we can let the cat out the bag on how to score, to score goals and to open up positions for scoring goals. Right. Now... I want to give you a little information. Mm -hmm. Long before I ever met you, mm -hmm. I knew of your name. Mm -hmm. And I, know of your, I knew of your stature as mm -hmm. a footballer because mm -hmm. you were my uncle's idol, mm -hmm. Steve David. That name would be called in my house all the time mm -hmm. because my uncle 
you were his idol, right? And he used to tell me, you could score goals? You feel you could score goals? You feel you could score goals like Steve David? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and he would he drilling that into me. Now, I've never seen Steve David. I don't know who the Steve David is, but I am, I am always being told of Steve David until I grew up and I understood that, well, you know, he was a prolific striker and so forth and so forth and that kind of thing, right? The, the, I'm, 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 I'm saying that to say the, the prolific goal scorer of long ago, right? Which, all right, you would have your era. I would have been in a different era. Mm -hmm. No, there's something slipping. There's something slipping because we can look back and see that Kenwin Jones stood up there for some far while. And then after that, we didn't get a striker to score a goal for Trinidad and Tobago for about three or four years. Mm -hmm. Our strikers now, at the senior team level, are not scoring. We're not getting strikers to score. Where is, why, are we, why are we looking for strikers to score when, <laughs> when they reach senior team level? What, what are we developing? So is it that the kid would have been good enough to be a striker coming all the way through and then when he reached senior team level, he lost his ability? No. Mm -hmm. Are we developing the correct player through these different stages so that when he reaches the senior team level, he can climax? Are we doing these things? This is what, this is, this is, this is what we, have to, we have to tap into. Now, I am saying in order to develop, I am looking at international level, eh? in mm -hmm. order to develop the striker that is going to score for Trinidad and Tobago at every level, I am saying from academy level, we have to leave this striker or leave this player to play, make mistakes, understand the game through trial and error, play in formation and structure and keep developing, 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 developing to the point where now we do, not ex we do not expose him to competition and take him away from development, his development work, because these boys are too young to be taken away from development work. Mm -hmm. So now, when these boys reach a particular age, then they need to be fine-tuned. How do we fine-tune? We fine-tune these boys by making them understand that it is a, as you said and when you started, it is a constant movement in the box for a striker all the time. So where you actually would score is not where you would start. You would have, you might you might you might you might jog you might jog ten feet forward, then you might have to jog at ten feet back, then you might have to go last post and score. You might have to come last post and then end up first post and score. You might have to go and, and, and get the ball played into you, knit the game, peel off, and then score. So I am saying that looking at it from that standpoint, and, and, and again I'm saying for Trinidad and Tobago, not, 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 not clubs and that, for the country. I'm saying, as coaches, we need to fine-tune strikers. You have to fine-tune a goalkeeper and you have to fine-tune a goal scorer. You ha we have to find it. We have to teach them the little runs, the little peels, the little opening of the body. We have to teach them all these things. How do we do this? Again, we have to make sure that these kids play in formation and structure. 
and allow them to make mistakes let's let's just fast forward based on what we're saying here now and go straight to Erling Haaland and, and Erling Haaland is showing you that unless he gets injured at the rate he's going he's going to score over 45 goals for Manchester City maybe over 50 goals for Manchester City this season and look at him a, a constant mover a co intelligence not just the fact that he is big and he has an exceptional technical ability but he knows where to go somebody fine-tuned him somebody fine-tuned him and we have a lot of that in Trinidad and Tobago but nobody's taking the time to fine-tune them fine-tuning a striker is the final piece of the puzzle in his development well don't you think it's pretty much instinct and uh, but in the development i think the coaches will take you through drills for example I remember we do drills with 10 or 20 balls and this one is is like the suicide one they when they put like 20 balls and you have to hit one and go back around and come and hit second one and go by the time you end up at the 20th ball, you almost want to pass out. Right. Because you're sprinting and you're going back, you're sprinting and going back. And, you know, and it, it's a drill you have to give it your all because that's how you get better as you, as you, you start losing win. Mm -hmm. When you start losing win, you start losing skill. Right. Yeah. And when you start losing skill, you can hit the target like you used to. Right. Legs, so, legs get weaker. Right, your legs are weak and everything. Yeah. So, and concentration uh, goes. Concentration and all that. So that sharpens up all of that. Right. So there's a lot of drills will make you get sharp for when you get posi in position. But the thing about getting in position, I don't think anybody can teach that. You just sometimes everything. Everybody goes there, and you you pull it, pull out. And you stand there waiting for the ball to come because ball always finds the space. It, 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 ball it, money, it, it for me, honestly, it definitely cannot be taught. Yeah. It can be fine-tuned, but it can't be taught. Right. No. I think, I think that the exceptional kid is born with that, and he himself might be able to fine-tune himself. That's the right. exceptional one. Yes. The others, I think some are born with it, and they would need to be fine-tuned. Right, mm -hmm. but really and truly, I think you, I, 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 I honestly think you had to be born with, you had to be born with that ability to and get I, to get in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. to read the game from the front, and always be in the right place at the right time. I think you had to be born with that. The basic rule to that the goal scoring is the ball always finds the space. Yeah. So you every space around you expect to see the ball show up. Right. And then make sure you keep watching the goal and uh, knowing where the goalkeepers are in position. You have to be looking around and making sure you know where everybody is. Right. From the time it comes and it, the ball comes in, you're there to, to finish it off. Yeah. So it is, it is, it is um, instinct, I say. And, and sometimes you go back after the game and you sit down and you're playing over the game and it's like, you wonder how did you do that? Now, now the top class striker obviously instinctively will always be in the right place at the right time, right? right. Most of the time, ninety percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And but he wouldn't always score instinctive goals. No, the top class striker would score goals um, instinctively. He would score goals sometimes based on other attributes. You know, um, like for instance, speed. He might just be able to run past a guy and score. Right. Um, his technical ability, he might just be able to curl the ball into a corner and score. Um, sometimes the ones who are good um, headers of the ball, the fact that they could jump high and get that ball down in the right um, position of the goal and score. So it's not always instinct the, the um, striker would score on. But the instinctive goal is usually a goal that is scored when the game is tight. It's a hard game. You meet a defense that you can't crack. 
and you have to now outsmart right. the opposition. Right. And, and that is the time now where your skill and all these things, it don't matter because you, meet a, you have met a defender who is your match. Right. Now you have to outthink the opponent. Right. And the ability to outthink the opponent and get in the right place at the right time with all your other attributes, with your speed and your skill and all that kind of thing to score, I think that is what you can teach. Have you ever, or do you, did you, because I did, set, you know you have half chances and full chances in a game. So you ever set marks, I need at least three chances each half or, or whatever. Or in the game, I need so, so many chances. Whether it's half or full chance, I need to find myself those. Have you set benchmarks for the game ever as a striker? Well, um, personally, for me as a striker, mm -hmm. I, um, if I didn't score in a game, I would try to score, make sure I try to score first half into the next game. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, if no, hardly likely I wouldn't score in three 45 minute periods because a game is two 45 minutes and then first half of the next game that would have been three 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, that I, I wasn't the type of striker that had droughts, long droughts, mm -hmm. and this is what now I'm trying to instill in the players that I coach. Um, strikers need to score all their chances. They have to try to score that. We understand that you can't score all, but if a whole game passes and you didn't score, then you have to try your hardest to score in the first half of the next game. Mm -hmm. Because you want to make up for the game, for the game yeah. that you didn't score. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from the standpoint where it, it, the benchmark shouldn't be you need three chances or two chances or whatever. If you, the first chance comes, the first chance that comes and you can score, score. Well, not to score. You, 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 oh, for example, I need three shots, open shots or clear shots or half chances in the first half. I need to make them happen. And I need three in the second half. So if you get two in the first half, you say, well, I need to get four in the second half. But, so, but, but if you don't get any... It, are, you going to okay. say, are you going to say that you're playing badly? What if, no. you met, what if you've met a team that is very good defensively and, 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 they, and, and you've met your match? You met your match? Yeah, you had to find a way to get it? Yeah, you had to find a way, but it's not like you're playing badly. So you just keep, you just keep working and plugging away, you know? Because sometimes um, there are games that um, are settled by a goal. Who scored first win? And... Um, it, that one goal comes from the, 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 the brain or the brilliance of a, a, one, one, a unique player, you know, so. Well, uh, because, I mean, you set targets, but it doesn't mean you have to get it. But you say, hey, I got to hustle. And yeah, but you definitely have to try. You have to try. Yeah, you have to try. And, and it's, it's difficult. But so, you know, you find a way to motivate you. I never play against defense. I play against the, other, the strikers of the other team. You cannot outplay me. So this is how I play. I am going to play the striker from the last team and not, not defense I'm playing against. I'm, I need to get them work so they don't yeah. mess with my defense. All right. We've got one minute left. Any final parting words on, on anything? Um, I um, just want to tell the coaches in Trinidad and Tobago that um, you know, I was having a discussion with some coaches and um, they, they were not aware of certain things. Um, me, um, me breaking it down for them, they mm -hmm. were able to understand and um, the, the awareness, the, the lack of awareness comes from a position where they didn't understand that development, development training is different from competition training. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's two different ball games. It's chalk and cheese. Okay, Dexter, thank you uh, so much for being here. Thank appreciate you, you, appreciate all the, the talk. Yeah. And as two strikers, yeah. thank you. Yeah.
Um, is uh, NCBN. Thank you for giving us the opportunity, viewers. Thank you for tuning in every Monday night at eight. I'm um, not Monday, sorry, Tuesday night at eight. And we, you know, um, for the viewers, we have a Facebook page. You can check us out, and we have an email address, fieldofdreamtt at gmail dot com, where you can drop us a line. This show has ended. Go in peace. My name is Steve David. Good night.